The school bus, a staple of US and Canadian life, ferrying children to their places of education every morning. Much like many other everyday things, we can grow to take them and the fact their occupants will arrive at their destination safely for granted. Sadly, for those on board one Fox River Grove bus, their journey would be the exception to the rule. Six fifteen on October twenty fifth, nineteen ninety five, and it's a crisp, cold autumn morning in Fox River Grove, Illinois, as school bus number one hundred three leaves the garage. Most of the other buses were already on their way by now, but the driver for Route 47 155 that served Cary Grove High School was a no-show, their bed proving too hard to escape that frosty morning. The scramble to find a driver was resolved when Patricia Kattenkamp was chosen as a substitute driver. She was a safety officer, but had experience driving school buses though she had never driven this route before and was already behind schedule by the time the bus was on its way. All along the route, students were huddled together wondering where their morning bus was. Among them were twin brothers Brian Marino and Michael Lucas, both in their freshman year, and Stephanie Fulham, a bright teenager who loved to sing and dance. Patricia Kattenkamp would make her first pickup at 6.55, 20 minutes behind schedule. The students helping her with the rest of the route. Some 10 or so miles away in Crystal Lake, train driver Ford Dotson Jr. climbs into the cab of Metro's Union Pacific Northwest Line number 624 to Chicago. At 7 a.m., the train with its 120 passengers and three crew members began its journey, rumbling along the tracks at up to 80 miles per hour. Those on board would have no idea that just 10 minutes later their journey would end in disaster. 7.05 and by then Captain Camp had picked up the last of the students. Among them were the twins Brian and Michael. As freshmen the unwritten rule is that they would sit at the front of the bus while the older students hung out at the back. They decided to try their luck, however, with Michael heading to the back of the bus. But a group of Brian's friends pulled him down into the seats at the front. 7.10 and the bus, now 40 minutes late, pulls up to the Algarkin Road train crossing. Due to how the lights work, Cat and Camp took the bus over the tracks and up to the stop in an effort to get the lights to change to green. Unbeknownst to her, she had not completely cleared the crossing and a portion of the bus still sat protruding over the tracks. Not knowing what was to come, some students on board began to joke about being hit by a train. Approaching was the Metra 624, also known as the Flyer, as it skipped most stations and could travel up to 90 miles per hour. Helmed by Ford Dotson Jr., it was traveling at 69 mile an hour as it approached the crossing. Still some 2,300 feet away, Dotson spots the bus crossing slowly. As seconds ticked past, the section went through its phases, allowing pedestrians to clear before lowering the gates. When one of the gates hit the top of the bus, the jokes on board gave way to panic, with the students shouting for Cat and Camp to move the bus. Perhaps mistaking their pleas for typical student rowdiness, she didn't. Three inches of the bus still protruded over the rail, but the body of the 624 protruded three feet beyond the tracks. As Cat and Camp waits for the lights to change, Dotson sounds his air horn several times to warn the driver, but to no avail. He slams on the brakes, but can only bring the 624's 200 tons down to 60 mile an hour before disaster strikes. 7.10 and the 624 impacts the rear end of the school bus, spinning the body 180 degrees and ripping it clean off the chassis. Four students were ejected from the vehicle upon impact. All were killed. A nurse who had witnessed the crash from a nearby coffee shop was one of the first on the scene. 
she tended to one student who had been severely injured using a turkey baster in an effort to remove blood from his lung. He passed away in her arms. On board the bus, amid the carnage and screams, Brian slowly took in his surroundings, ringing in his ears and body in pain. He was battered and bruised, but alive. Finding his brother Michael slumped over a chair and not breathing, he moved his brother's head onto his lap and screamed at him to breathe. And he did. The pair survived, but both had sustained injuries that would affect them throughout their lives with Michael suffering a major skull fracture from ear to ear. A bleed on the brain would also lead to him losing many memories from before the crash. 718 and first responders reached the scene. Soon, 30 ambulances lined the streets carrying away the wounded and dying. Worried parents descended on the local fire department where the coroner read out a morbid register of those who had tragically died in the accident. The initial list stated that all those that had died were boys. This sparked hope in the family of Stephanie Fulham, who later learned she had been flown to a nearby hospital. Sadly, this hope was soon extinguished as she would succumb to her injuries the next day. In all, seven students lost their lives in the crash with 24 others along with Cat and Camp being injured. Most suffering blunt trauma and head injuries, with the most seriously injured suffering skull fractures, lacerations and internal injuries. An investigation was soon launched into the collision, with it discovering that the traffic light holding the bus at the intersection had actually turned green six seconds before the impact, but Cat and Camp claims that she was distracted by the screams of the students on board and had failed to see it. They also found that another cause was the design of the crossing itself. Originally, the Northwest Highway ran as a two-lane road with a roughly 60-foot distance between the road and rail tracks, more than enough space for a 40-foot bus. But in an effort to encourage development in the area and limit congestion, the two lanes were turned into a four-lane highway. Along with the new school road layout, this reduced the distance between the road and tracks from 60 foot to 30. There were also issues with the signaling system installed to negate the issue. The warning lights on the railroad crossing would activate 20 seconds before the arrival of a train. However, the traffic light clearing the rail intersection only allowed cars to clear 18 seconds after the railroad signals activated, giving vehicles only a two to six second window to clear the tracks. The Fox River Grove incident left a massive impact, not only on the local area, but on the state of Illinois and beyond. Though, despite a raft of new safety measures being implemented after the crash, there are still hundreds of collisions between trains and vehicles in the state each year. For those who survived the crash, their bodies may have healed for the most part, but the psychological scars remain. The twins, Michael and Brian, both now work as firefighter paramedics in Crystal Lake. Michael never regained the memories from before the crash, but perhaps mercifully, he doesn't remember the crash itself either. The train engineer, Ford Dotson Jr. has stated he still has recurring nightmares about the event and asked for a friend to be by his side the next time he was tasked with traveling through the crossing. He considered quitting his job after the accident, but with the help of a peer support group, he continued on, retiring in 2015. Patricia Kattenkamp was taken to a separate hospital after the accident, away from the students. Upon leaving, she went into hiding and hasn't spoken publicly about the event, though those close to her say she was devastated by what had happened. Despite the contributing factors, some who were on the bus that day still blame her for what happened. Teresa Robertson, a survivor from that day, stating, I was there. I saw everything. I know she was to blame for this. Several memorials exist in memory of those who lost their lives that day. 
two of the most poignant are the one at the school the bus was heading to and the memorial that now sits at the crossing dedicated to those who lost their lives those who survived and to those whose lives were affected by what happened that cold october morning <laughs>